amazing honor to be able to listen to the community and find out what we wanted to talk about, what's what's going on. And I was really honored that early in this discovery, I was introduced to Dr. Anthony. And Dr. Anthony and I were talking and we really drafted a team of all-stars here that is gonna have this panel discussion and talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion in the pandemic and about their experiences. So with that in mind, Lyle, I'm gonna pass the torch off to you. Take us away. <laughs> Uh, Benny, thanks so much. So cool to be here. Benny, your enthusiasm is just is just amazing. I've been smiling all throughout your, <laughs> you know, your whole, uh, you know, sort of monologue there. Um, just a couple of ground rules first, or just uh, just laying out what to expect. Um, you know, we're going to ask the panel a couple of questions, uh, you know, related to their experiences, and then there'll be two rounds of questions. And um, so each of those rounds will probably comprise about you know, seven to eight minutes uh, total. And, uh, and the panel questions about, you know, about five or seven minutes or so. So these, these, this discussion might be about 30 minutes, you know, give or take, and then we'll hopefully have enough time for, uh, for Q and A. So uh, let me introduce, first of all, the overall, you know, arching, you know, topic, and then the introductions. I mean, we're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we want to sort of dig at, you know, what, what are some of the inequities that were revealed by this, this, this pandemic? And obviously that is still going on. And now it seems like it's coming back and maybe even more dramatically. How is that affecting, you know, um, entrepreneurs? How is it affecting, uh, you know, uh, business owners of color? Um, and how is that changing our, you know, what ways is that changing our society? So let me uh, introduce, you know, our panelists. Uh, first, uh, Dr. Ruben Anthony is in his sixth year, is that right? Uh, he's the CEO of, <laughs> it seems like yesterday, of, uh, of the Urban League of Greater Madison. Uh, the Urban League, just a, a, you know, a quick aside, you know, ensures that African-Americans and other community members are educated, employed, and empowered, you know, to live well and advance professionally. Uh, and, you know, while the, the, the Urban League of Greater Madison is, is a little over 50 years old, it's, it's, it's an organization that's over 100 years old, you know, nationally. Uh, Dr. Anthony has been a manager for over 27 years. And before that, he started a management and planning firm that specialized in civil rights and government contracting, where he also served, you know, as, uh, as the interim di director of Milwaukee County's uh, Community Business Development Program. Uh, responsible for enforcing compliance and procurement and contract. And he also served as a disadvantaged business uh, enterprise capacity building advisor to the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewage Di uh, Sewerage District and the Minnesota Department of Transportation and to Dulles Airport in Washington, D.C. But prior to that, Dr. Anthony was senior vice president of the Palloon Companies, an engineering firm, and the majority of his career has been you know, as manager with Wisconsin Department of Transportation, where he served in several roles, including deputy secretary and also chief operations officer. So in addition to uh, Dr. Anthony's many accomplishments, he's won many local, regional, and national awards from the U.S. Small Business Administration, the Wisconsin Supplier Diversity Council, and the National Association of Minority Contractors. So please welcome Dr. Anthony. Thank you, sir. Uh, Pranisha Clifton is a, <laughs> is a graduate you know, of the University of uh, Wisconsin-Madison, now serves as its Director of Youth Protection and Compliance at the university. Uh, she's a certified uh, Presidium Youth Protection Guardian and trained in youth behavior assessments and youth mental health first aid and had uh, you know, over 20 years of pre-college and youth programming experience. Uh, she's also the founder of Seeing is Believing, a multicultural infusion of excellence into traditional K-12 STEAM curriculum. Seeing is Believing helps recruit and retain educators of color or help close that gap by infusing culture through workshops and exposure to professionals of color. Uh, currently, uh, Pranisha is a member of the Higher Education Prevention Network serving on the membership committee as well as the chair in the Big Ten Youth Policy uh, Consortium. Uh, and one of her major initiatives with the Big Ten Policy is the um, architecture of compliance within youth programming in higher ed. And it's a research doc 
uh, based on youth programming, uh, nationwide standards, historical gaps, and the translation of typical camp scenarios and vocabulary to uh, higher education and open camp settings. Uh, Pranisha has spent many years abroad in education programming and from what I understand is also an opera singer and in China at that. So please join me in welcoming Pranisha. Hello. Hello. So, you know, I, I want to just talk to the panel about their specific experiences, and I'll start with you, Dr. Anthony. So what have you been working on? Uh, and tell me, tell us a little bit about, you know, your, you know, what's going on with your organization and, and what have you been doing differently, you know, in the last year? Yeah, so one of the things that I tell my staff is that the pandemic has put us in a position where we see uh, virtual operating, you know, as the, uh, the great uh, equalizer. And so we served up uh, many of our programs um, by using um, the different types of uh, social media uh, connections. But in the midst of all of the things that are going on, it, it's caused us to really focus in on how um, minority owned businesses or BIPOC businesses are being um, affected to a greater extent than uh, normal times and to a greater extent than uh, normal businesses. And so one of our primary focuses is trying to build a black business hub, a black business hub that will cause a renaissance in South Madison, which is noted as um, one of the um, uh, ethnic enclaves or probably the most noted ethnic enclave uh, in the city of Madison. So we expect um, to cause like, as this gentrification is really happening, even during the, during the pandemic, uh, that we have to find a place that our black businesses can call their own. And so we expect to um, uh, stand up a hub that will be uh, an economic um, stimulation and a place where we can have 100 plus businesses launch uh, and provide them with uh, good spaces. Our hub is expected to create 150 jobs in South Madison, 200 jobs, uh, temporary jobs in construction and have a minority business goal of 30 plus. And so we expect to also bring in uh, some um, black developers, get them trained up so that they can participate in this economy of growth that's happening right now because real estate and development is happening in a great way. Uh, so, but we also expect to put together what we call a black business hub uh, accelerator uh, where this is an opportunity to allow um, small businesses to re receive um, technical assistance, uh, cap capital access pr uh, to, to programs, uh, to drive this entrepreneurial economic system and to stabilize and help black businesses grow. Uh, we expect um, to leverage the, this program with um, grants and loans. Uh, we've raised over a million dollars uh, to start uh, to help businesses do business planning, business expansion grants, and then we expect our hub to be a place where there's small business uh, technical assistance like training, education, individualized business and coaching, and much more. So I'll, I'll stop at that. But we really believe that the intergenerational wealth, you know, uh, it has to become more than a conversation and we have to do things to make it happen. So at the Urban League, that's what we're focusing on and how, how we can get off the sideline and begin to give a place for um, BIPOC businesses to kind of grow, develop, and have the resources in an environment to grow and expand. That's fascinating. Let me just follow up a little bit on, on that with the Black Business Hub, Dr. Anthony. Uh, what kinds of businesses do you expect to be in the hub and what's the status you know, of its rollout right now? Well, well thank you. So the, the Black Business Hub, first of all, we expect to put a shovel in the ground this fall, you know, most likely October. We expect it to be built out in 12 months. So next fall, um, 2022, we expect it to be open. In the hub, you know, we're going to have co-working space for um, um, consultant businesses or businesses that really need offices to do their building. But on the first floor, we, we're expecting that we're going to have maybe uh, 30, 25, 30 businesses because we're going to have a feed kitchen where those catering businesses that need to have freezing space, cooking space can have a place. So 15, 20 businesses there. But right on that first floor also, um, we're looking to have a soul food Caribbean style type uh, restaurant. And then we have um, more spaces for almost like an airport concessionary type, you know, thing where a multitude of businesses might find their place here. 
on that second floor, uh, again, we expect to have support services like the Black Chamber uh, of Commerce, WIBIC, and, and other support services to help these businesses grow and thrive. Wow, that's great. I mean, quite a, quite a vision. And I'm sure maybe uh, during the uh, Q&A, you might uh, be hit with a few more questions you know, around sure. the panel. Uh, Pranisha, so you are quite an innovator. <laughs> What, what, what all have you been doing, you know, during the pandemic and what are you and the organizations, uh, what are you guys working on? I guess the question should be, what haven't we been doing? So <laughs> seeing as believing came out of three problems that one was there wasn't enough representation in the classroom of black educators. Um, the second issue that came out of it as a classically trained opera singer who performed for 20 years while writing programs, I saw all of my friends out of work and struggling during this time. And so I was wondering how I could get them in work and get them to tell their stories. And then the third thing that came up was we were having mental health crises, especially um, amongst young black men. So how do we infuse altruism? How do we infuse um, mental health first aid supports? How do we infuse resilience in our youth? So out of that came seeing is believing. So we created a portfolio of workshops that are specifically around resilience. So one of the um, workshops is called the power of no. Um, statistically, if you teach um, young people how to accept rejection at a young age, you have the ability to combat domestic violence. You have the ability to build resilience and confidence and self-esteem. Who better to talk about rejection than performers who literally for every four no's, they get one yes. So to be able to create this workshop and to have them present on it while sharing their real life experience really created an opportunity to put performers back into work and to really create a real life experience for the youth to understand and to connect with. The next thing, those same workshops, I specifically targeted performers of color to then bring into those classrooms and to those specific workshops. So it was no longer just, you know, they they had different people that worked in the school that weren't their teachers that were black and brown, because you know, two to 5% of black educators, I mean, of educators here in Madison are black, right? And so they're not seeing a lot of black educators. But the first time you put a Grammy award winning African American tenor in front of them and say, not only do black people sing opera, they're Grammy award winning opera singers. So the next time they tell you that black people don't do this, or that you can only be this, they have something to change with. So I spent a lot of time with seeing is believe in not only doing it virtually because most of my performer friends are from all around the world. So being able to bring them to Madison has been quite an experience. Then the other thing is to be able to take these resilience exercises and also put them out in a park so they can have them in a safe manner uh, where they're not you know, spreading COVID. So what we have is black excellence in the park. So we have scavenger hunts where they have famous black people all over the park and they go and find their cards. And then for every card that they find, they come back and they tell us about that person and they get tickets and they can buy ice cream with tickets and they can also buy different resources in the community with those tickets. So what we're doing is we're also infusing literacy there and reminding them of their excellence. The last thing that came out of it was I'm a certified mental health first aid specialist and I bring in a culturally responsive approach to it to say, you know, mental health issues look differently amongst black and brown children. And so I teach specifically from that lens and I'm able to teach it virtually. So I've been able to teach over a hundred people mental youth mental health first aid uh, during the pandemic. So every furlough day for my regular job, I was out in the state teaching online mental health first aid. So that's what CNS Believe In has been up to. Did, uh, how important was, uh, virtual as an avenue, you know, for your business throughout this period? It was the most important thing, you know, because we weren't finding these performers of color, these experts of color, um, that I wanted to bring into the classroom just here in Madison. So I wanted to really just introduce them to people from all over the world. Um, and sometimes it's helpful to see outside of your own bubble of your city so that you know what your potential is. And we wouldn't have been able to do it without the virtual space. Terrific. Well, let's get into the first round you know, of questions. And we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, the inequities uh, that were revealed you know, by this pandemic. Um, I just wanna talk a little bit in generalities around you know, just businesses in general. Uh, you know, everybody, every business was impacted you know, by this pandemic. Uh, what, what do you see as some of the common challenges you know, that, uh, the, that you saw that people were dealing with 
and um, and what were some of the hardest things for people to try to overcome, you know, if they did? Uh, can I start with you, Francia? Sure. My biggest observation was access to technology. You know, so many kids had like their hot spots, but they didn't work really well, and they were cutting out in the middle of presentation. So, like quality access to quality equipment, and then on top of that, if you had four family members. Uh, siblings that were online at the same time, they kept crashing too. So even though we got technology into the space and we got these workshops in the space, it was hard for them to be as effective as they needed to be. What'd you see, Dr. Anthony? Okay, first um, I'll say uh, the Urban League does way more than just the business stuff that I'm gonna talk about today. But in line with um, Panisha, uh, one of the things that we saw was that a focus was um, put on access to technology for kids. But one of the focus that we made was that our observations that we made was that kids didn't have access to instructional support. And so we opened up uh, uh, a, parent, a parental support you know, operation just to help the parents know how to use the virtual campuses and all those other things so they can learn uh, to use the technology that they were sending home. I just wanted to say that because that was a big challenge uh, and Pernice is right on target with that. But from a business standpoint, you know, the thing that we saw that was most heartbreaking is that when they rolled out the PPP loans, um, African-American and BIPOC businesses couldn't get them because they didn't have the uh, banking relationships. And so only 5% of um, African-American firms were able to take advantage of the, uh, the PPP loan. And one of the problems that they had with that was that the, um, uh, they didn't have anybody to provide them with the technical assistance, even to prepare the loan until it was like late, you know, and then when it was late, you know, we had some foundations to come on board and to help, you know, prepare the loans. But by that time they were in the back of the lines. And so eventually some got it, but only on that initial run, only 5% got the uh, PPP loans. And the other thing, you know what they say, like when um, white America gets a cold, um, um, black America gets the pneumonia and that was, um, you know, evident, you know, um, during COVID, it was worse um, because face-to-face um, -face operations uh, shut down. And so we already had a problem with getting access to opportunity for um, um, Black businesses. Well, the pipeline was shut down. You know, we had pipeline problems before we started COVID, but there was no, um, you know, not many um, African-American firms uh, in the pipeline. And so the pipeline didn't grow. It got worse than it was before um, the COVID. And then uh, most businesses lost um, significant revenue or they shut down. So some of the typical challenges that um, black business faced was exacerbated during uh, COVID. Ca uh, access to capital uh, to build, expand and exist, that went away. Um, firms had problems with cash flow. Um, and then firms needed more so than ever for somebody to vouch for them, to co-sign for them to say, bank, give Ruben some money because you know, um, I mean, he's a he's a he's a viable business, and that they need this money during this time. They didn't have no co-signers. Um, capacity building. Uh, we really needed mentor protege um, to happen for where prime or general contractors would would mentor these businesses. Less of that happened. Uh, we needed projects to be right sized so that they're small enough that these businesses could do it. They were just locked out. And then we need to be able to build a business uh, around like government because a lot of times. Uh, you know, um, government set these goals on projects and, and, and prime contractors and others are able to get this work, but minority contractors can never really build businesses around these governments like everybody else could do. So we have to break down those barriers and when we get further down, I'll talk some more about, you know, how we spent time helping break those barriers down. So, and I'll just say this and then I'll stop. We need real supply of diversity uh, from government and corporate citizens because it's just not, it's just not happening. And so one of the things that you know was happening, I think that was positive too, is that pop-up you know operations happen for businesses like downtown. Forty businesses closed up because of Black Lives Matter and COVID, and but um, the downtown Madison Incorporated was able to allow some of that space to be used for pop-up businesses, and that was really good for minority-owned businesses. I just wanted to add one thing in there too about the isolation factor that the pandemic showed you know, and how, you know, it disproportionately affected black and brown folks, not just the physical COVID, but the mental illness associated with it, right? And so we went from one in 10 youth having a mental health crisis to one in six youth having a mental health crisis, and specifically young black boys, 
But on the back end of that, for families not to have the information, not only mental health supports, but also what it is to create a protective factor for your youth. And if we don't have that knowledge and we don't have our that information, a lot of our families ended up being helpless. And so that's one thing that the pandemic showed as well is access to mental health resources. So for Madison, just following up on some of those comments, I mean, we've, we've, we've learned and we are learning some very tough lessons and in many cases, some tragic lessons. If this, you know, pandemic, you know, gets worse and the government, you know, comes back with, you know, after this round of uh, PPPs or whatever, are we, you know, is, is Madison in better, a little bit better shape, you, you know, to, to allow some of these companies to take advantage of some of these company, uh, uh, opportunities better or are some of those opportunities just lost? You want me to go or you want? I, I, I think that um, we are in better um, shape uh, because um, the uh, Small Business Administration understands. Uh, I think that, um, you know, understanding that there's an infrastructure bill, you know, coming, uh, you know, from the um, Biden administration. So um, right now the economy is going to be flooded with a lot of, um, you know, government infrastructure um, projects. And so there will be ample opportunity uh, for, um, you know, minority companies to um, participate that way. But the Small Business Administration is um, cognizant under this administration of the fact that, you know, that there were barriers that stopped uh, minority owned businesses from having equal access to um, support and help. And so they're proactive now. In fact, uh, we had the um, SBA administrator and the governor in our building a couple of weeks ago talking about, you know, how, you know, we need to kind of bridge opportunities for minority owned businesses. So I think um, we're positioned uh, much better uh, than um, they were positioned uh, in the past. And, and I will say that the more, um, if you know better, you do better. So we've learned a lot during this pandemic and you are starting to see people do better and they're being proactive in their approaches with engagement with the diverse populations. So I do think that those resources, God forbid, if this was to expand and happen again, I think that people will do things differently because inherently I believe that we have a culture of want to do better. I don't think that people are out there and just don't care. Madison is a very sympathetic and empathetic city that can make change. Of the um, of the businesses or the minority businesses that did get PPP, the 5% or so, did you see any differences or trends in how they operated, you know, through this environment? So I, I can say just in general, I can speak to uh, trends because to be quite honest, um, I really, um, the, the PPP and how um, companies were getting it, um, people were um, not, you know, fully disclosing when they got it and how they got it. But I can, I, but, but I can tell you um, that there's certainly, uh, you know, some trends that are, are worth uh, are speaking about. You know, so one of the things we got to recognize, like even before COVID and even more so during COVID, is that the gig economy, you know, where people needed more than one job, you know, and so they're, they're cutting grass, they're doing Ubering and all that other kind of stuff. But those who were doing face-to-face -face opportunities, they were impacted where they actually lost revenue, particularly if that was their sole thing. But, but folks were doing that. Another concept emerged, you know, during the, um, uh, the COVID called the um, poly work, because now we're on, um, uh, you know, we can do social media so you can be on your phone and you can be on here. In fact, young people, even some of my staff have figured out how they can work for me and work for somebody else. And so the critical question that we have to ask in our economy is, are we going to have that? You know, are we going to let, you know, folks who are really talented, you know, if we want to keep them, uh, work for us and work for somebody else in the same time, you know, just on, on different vehicles. Um, the other thing that we, we saw, um, we, 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 we saw, um, um, the, the ability, you know, for, um, uh, um, folks who uh, uh, had uh, just to communicate by uh, social media level the playing field. Before, if you had brick and mortar, um, you were kind of like king. But you saw now, you know, businesses getting out of brick and mortar, going to pop up, going to virtual. And I was telling um, my staff that, you know, before, you know, because we got a couple of buildings or we operate out of a couple of buildings, you know, we had a competitive advantage uh, on other um, nonprofits. But now with all the business being conducted virtually, 
it like even the playing field some. And so small businesses now are, on, are not quite on equal footing, but they are on better footing uh, than uh, some other um, folks, you know, are uh, during this time. And so, but, uh, no, go ahead. Mm -hmm. No, one thing that I noticed about the PP, uh, PPE loans was that they didn't allow for space of, for innovation. So you had all of these young folks that saw the problems that were coming out of COVID, but because they weren't a pre-existing organization, they couldn't go and apply for those loans to then put their solutions out into the field. So like when I created See and Is Believe In, I was completely self-funded and went and just asked friends and family and whoever I could beg, borrow and steal from, because I'm like, this needs to happen for our community. So I hope that you know they will recognize that as a gap because we have so many young innovators and this virtual space was a space for them to shine if they would have been given the opportunity. Hey, Rob, can I just say one more thing to that point? So during this COVID time, businesses, businesses without walls became super, super strong, stronger than ever before. Interesting. Yeah. Um, one last question before we start to head into you know, our second topic. You know, so through the pandemic, obviously we've had, you know, Black Lives Matter and, and also, you know, a lot of social justice, <clears throat> you know, historic, uh, you know, events, which caused a lot of companies to uh, think more and hard about their DE&I efforts or even establish those if they didn't. Uh, it seems as if some of those efforts were derailed by some companies and some actually increased those. And I'm wondering, it, 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 what's your sense about Madison? You know, what would you say has been the case in Madison and uh, how could that affect, you know, entrepreneurship and minority entrepreneurship for sort of the near future? I will say that I have never received so many communications for um, consulting work in my life. That's amazing. So I think that uh, there's a lot of intentionality out there once they know who's out there and who's doing what. So I do think that we're seeing um, a trend, a change. Yeah, I, I would agree. I would say that um, uh, companies were more woke, quote unquote woke, uh, than ever before. And um, at minimum, companies put out you know platitudes you know, midway companies put out opportunities and they hung opportunities out there, you know, for, uh, for a while, you know, and uh, some companies really got serious. They rolled up their sleeves. Many of the foundations, the every foundation, you know, and other, you know, uh, foundations really got dug deep, you know, into this and, and um, um, decided, you know, um, that they wanted to help. And so, I mean, the foundation stepped up and companies uh, have stepped up with their contributions and everything. But the critical piece is like, is that short lived or is that going to be, you know, um, the way that we continue um, to move? Uh, because, um, you know, um, supply diversity, you know, has to be a part, become a part of the culture of how we do things. It can't just be platitudes, you know, and, and it can't just be short sightedness. It has to be a way of um, uh, keeping um, equitable access um, to opportunity available to businesses and to people. And, you know, the moment that I'll believe it is when I actually see it as a line item in their annual budget. So it is not real if you're just donating one time. But if it's a commitment and that organization is now part of your organization's budget every single year to show your commitment to that diversity, then I will believe it. Well, one of the things I've seen before we move on to the next topic is that I mean, we, obviously there's a small amount of, of, of black people in Madison, but an even smaller amount that are employed by 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 companies maybe maybe half right so it's maybe seven percent you know african americans and maybe the labor for i mean in com companies hire about five percent yep. right or so um it, what's interesting is that a lot of minority entrepreneurs also have jobs you know they're doing these things on the side so i think whatever we all can do as madisonians to you know help people improve their minority hiring will also improve minority entrepreneurship down the road. Absolutely. This is definitely something that I've done on the side. Um, and what was um, effective in this was finding community partners. So one of the ways that we created altruism for youth was we taught over 100 youth how to cook during the pandemic. They took an online cooking class every Thursday night in partnership with Pasture and Plenty. And according to the Forum for Youth Investment, six out of 10 youth by the age of 21 won't know how to cook. 
And now all of a sudden we've opened up this now vocational pathway because now they're like, well, how do I become a chef? And how do I, you know, own, open my own restaurant? And these were the kids that were younger. They were like ages, um, maybe six to 15. So they weren't out in the streets necessarily doing the protest, but they felt helpless. And the fact that they could create a meal every night for their family after their parents worked two jobs trying to survive during the pandemic was truly amazing to see. Well, can I add to that? Because this is a rich uh, conversation. And I'll tell you, one of the things that we did at the Urban League is that we were encouraging companies to make sure that they had minority business enterprise goals. And one of the companies that we pressed um, was um, SSM. We had this thing that we called the Agenda South as we're watching the gentrification happen and the exclusion happen in, in South Madison. We asked the current um, or, or the former president, regional um, president of SSM uh, to hire more people and to when they started the $75 million construction project to set goals. Now there's no government that has um, required them to do this, but we asked them to do it anyway because it's in South Madison. And so they actually um, decided to, um, to have um, a labor goal of around 13%, you know, on this project of minority women uh, and, and um, uh, 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 disabled and veterans. And then they also had a, a goal uh, for businesses of um, um, 7%. But in July, with our involvement, they reached 21% of small business, uh, Wisconsin, uh, uh, women's businesses, DBE and veterans. And then they had a mentor protege piece where um, they committed to hire 13 small minority owned businesses and train them on the job. And that went over really well. That was the type of pushing that we did from a macro level. We also um, pushed the city the same way to say, you gotta be more inclusive. And so when we build our Southwest uh, Employment and Training Center, we asked them to hire a minority general contractor. So they hired a Migo Construction, a Latino company um, that had never been a GC before. The project turned out fine. And so we've been pushing that way to say, don't tell me that if you create an opportunity that these businesses won't step up. And, 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 and SSM set an example of, they weren't compelled to do anything. They did it because it was the right thing to do. And that's what we need companies to do. Well, and I wanted to throw in there, we when we taught the youth how to cook, we leveraged technology to do this. The classes were all virtual and we worked with Pasture and Plenty to get food shipped out to them. We had to leverage technology to create a mapping system that we could effectively deliver the food to hundreds of kids every Wednesday into Thursday. And so it was so interesting to see how technology allowed us to do this effectively and to really put it in everyone's hands. Got it. So gratifying and amazing to hear all these these stories and successes you guys have been part of it's just uh i'm just uh, honored for that so you know we spent a lot more time than we were budgeted for in this first topic but you know i think it was really great just to just to let this breathe a lot of stuff came out that i think was really well worth it um you know the second topic here is really about resources and what resources can you know entrepreneurs uh, entrepreneurs use and how can they access this to uh, to help move forward? Um, so, I think we we tackled a little bit of this, but uh, you, let's start with you, Dr. Anthony. What, in hindsight, what could have been done differently, resource-wise, to to support entrepreneurs? And are there some policies or programs that you know we that that could be used more effectively? Yeah, I would tell you, um, the Black Chamber of Commerce is a great resource. Um, you know, um, they really um, are just a gem that's probably underutilized in this community and that, that we need to go to more. Uh, the Latino Chamber of Commerce is also um, a good, you know, entity. And in fact, our, um, um, you know, uh, Citywide Chamber of Commerce with Zach Brandon is uh, also a great resource. WIBIC, you know, um, the women's, uh, you know, um, business focus organization is, is big and good. Uh, the Small Business Administration there with Eric Ness is good. And then the um, Upstart program for those businesses that are, you know, folks that are entrepreneurs and want to start a business. Upstart is a good program to get in. So uh, one second, can I just interrupt you there? So I understand, uh, uh, Pranisha, you were also part of Upstart? Yep, I'm a graduate of Upstart, yes. Me too. And you too, yeah, Dr. Yeah. Anthony. So let's talk about that a little bit. Um, you both had experiences with that. Can you describe, you know, what Upstart is? And then how did that help you and how would that help other folks? Go ahead, Pranisha. 
Well, um, so it was a series of courses. I believe it was six weeks and you met every Thursday and it had different business topics. So whether, you know, you were making a decision between becoming an LLC or becoming a nonprofit, you know, how do you set up a business plan? How do you do marketing, social media, things like that? So everything that you would need to consider in order to build a business, it gave you that information ahead of time. And then it also put you in uh, contact with professionals in the industry. So you could specifically ask your questions and have stable mentorship in your process. Then you also got to meet other business, uh, potential business owners that were kind of on the same path. So you kind of had a support system as you were making your plans and you could bounce ideas off of each other. So it was really like a learning hub for future business owners. How did that help you? I would say the biggest thing was my business plan and my marketing plan. Um, I had this big vision of how I wanted to do it. Um, and they were like, you need to focus it in more. You'll be able to engage people more. And I had no idea that I was thinking way too broadly for a launch. And so just to have that professional input on it and to see how much of a change it made to my business was amazing because you don't know what you don't know. So how about you, Dr. Anthony? Yeah. So, um, minority businesses are often accused of working in their business. If you are, um, a craft person, you know how to do your craft but you may not know how to do the accounting, may not know how to do the marketing, like Pranisha said. And so Upstart, you know, is the type of program that allows you to focus on your business. So I own two businesses when I came into Upstart and I know, um, uh, you know, accounting and the bookkeeping and all that stuff was the stuff that I didn't like to do. The <laughs> Upstart program gave you um, the ability to kind of reboot and have a fresh look at, you know, how you would, um, organize your business and also it gave you the ability to talk up i think about what one do you have a viable business and then second can you scale that business up and then how you can you know what are steps that you can do uh to do that but it also uh, uh, again allowed you to think about social media and how that played out into your business and then just how, how you maintain and grow your business so i really enjoyed it and I just wanted to give a shout out to Brian Lee, uh, who was my marketing instructor uh, for Upstart, who's here today. So uh, thank you for all that you do. Your uh, class was absolutely amazing. So, you know, for those in the in the audience that um, aren't quite familiar with Upstart, it's uh, it's a program supported by WARF, the Wisconsin Alumni uh, Research Foundation. It's a it's a it's a free program, you know, for, um, you know, people and women of color. Classes are Tuesdays, 6 to 830. And there's a session that starts September. 14th through November 16th. But if you want to know more about it, you know, please um, go online and find out. But um, there's and I want to say one more thing. It yeah. will even help you if you're an independent contractor. So if you're looking to do consulting work and not actually building a full on business, the Upstart courses will also help you with that. Terrific. So what, what are, are some other, you know, programs and resources that would be, you know, really good for entrepreneurs? So uh, if you want to go pretty sure i'll let you go. i just wanted to point out one more community resource which is each one teach one in their ajama markets um and they've been happening um through tara wilhelmy um so she has the ujama markets and then also the badger rock markets that happen every sunday so if you're a small business and you're looking to debut some of your products to the community just to get a filler that's a, another great resource out there to show your stuff terrific yeah. And, and then I would say, um, don't overlook the um, credit unions like Summit Credit Union and some of those other credit unions and special banks that programs have. But then also um, don't overlook your government agencies because um, with the um, city, um, they have um, a minority and small business function and that provides supportive services. Um, the county, Dane County has um, one that provides supportive services. And even the state has one with the Department of Administration that provides you know, assistance with, you know, getting contracts and then also places like the Department of Transportation, they have uh, a disadvantaged business enterprise arm that um, provides um, help and services to uh, small women, uh, disabled and minority owned businesses. I would also check the American Family Insurance Dream Bank website because they um, often do presentations around becoming a business owner or building your self-worth and things like that. So that's also another great resource if you're looking to build your business. Terrific. I, you know, one last question, um, and Benny, we can we can wrap up after this question or get uh, get audience questions. But you know, I was reading in some publication, I forget whether it's uh, you know Boston Consulting or Kinsey, one of the two, but they were talking about what they term the great resignation. And it's, it's, you know, due to the pandemic, there've been millions of folks that are leaving the workplace 
And like in April, you know, like 4 million people left the workplace um, because it was time to sort of reevaluate, you know, their lives and, and seek, you know, better work-life balance. And in some cases, you know, Pranish, you, you, you know, you know, some decided to, you know, go into business for themselves and control their own desti destiny. But there's a lot of emotional toll, you know, taken throughout this period, you know, the, 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 the anxiety, the isolation, the uncertainty, you know, and minority populations, I think, you know, have been, uh, you know, disproportionately affected. Um, and I know that I have, you know, even as a leader, you know, I, you know, you go through these things. Um, so as far as the emotional aspect of it, what would you guys say would be some good resources for those owners? I mean, everybody's affected by it, not just the business aspect of it, right? But the, the personal aspect, what are some resources that come to mind to help people emotionally I, through some things? I think if businesses would focus on marketing the transferable skill sets, valuing the transferable skill sets and recognizing that people may have 15 to 20 years experience of managing households or managing budgets and things like that, where it doesn't necessarily transfer from a degree, but it transfers from life experience. A lot of us had to pivot, like I, I think of my musician friends, who all of a sudden had to wake up one day over the last year and pivot into new careers because everything in music was shut down. And I worked with over 15 friends so they could change their resume to see you are more than just a musician. You are a whole person that also happens to be a performer, but you have many skills. And I think if more businesses would focus on that and say that they're open and welcome to that, they would get a more diverse population of employees as well as people that want to work with them. So vendors and consumers and things like that. So in terms of a resource that will help, um, my pastor often says, um, come to the church, you know, for help but also go to the psychologist and go to the psychiatrist too. Uh, a lot of times uh, African-Americans in general are afraid of the uh, mental health stigma. And when you're in business, you're stressed out during these times. And during these times of uh, COVID, you know, people are stressed out because their family members have been sick and some have been lost. And, and then you're trying to go about your day-to-day -day life. I would, I would agree with my pastors that you got to go and get, get help and talk through these issues. Here in Madison, there's a NESIS. It's, it's the, the largest African-American, um, uh, you know, um, psycho, uh, um, sociological organization to really help with mental health challenges. Uh, you've got churches like Mount Zion Baptist Church. They have a free, you know, assistance where you can come in there and get like um, uh, uh, access to a psychologist. And then there's another psychologist in town named Libby Lee, who's a, a good friend and uh, she's an independent. But I would I would tell business owners that don't, you know, stay locked up into your house if you're challenged, you know, at this time, go to the church and go get help, you know, from a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Do you feel that that's been an issue with uh, some of your constituents? Absolutely. Mental health is at the forefront of the families that I serve and the children that I serve, which is why mental health first aid has been such a push. So mental health first aid is what you do while you wait to get to those professionals, because though we have those professionals in the city, the wait list, the, the line, the time. So how do you triage an adult or a youth in crises until you can get the help that you need? I think every parent, every supervisor, every employer should have their staff trained in mental health first aid. So they know the importance of assessing for suicide and risk of harm. So they can understand how to listen non-judgmentally and give reassurance and information. And then so they can have a portfolio of things in their offices that support um, or encourage self-help and other supports. But they have to know how to triage in order to be in that fill-in space to retain and sustain their employees. So I, I definitely offer mental health first aid and I train all around the U.S. So if that is something that folks are interested in, please let me know. Thank you. Well, just to imagine your income coming to a drastic halt and you can't figure out how to feed your family and you're a small business. You don't know where to go for help because the only help you got is, you know, the resources that you have. If you're not bankable and you've just been going with, you know, the resources that you got, you know, I mean, you got a major challenge here because now you got to go and you got to go get in one of those food lines or some other line and, and try to make ends meet. And business owners, not just black business owners, but business owners in general were faced with that challenge. And, you know, even those, you know, leaders and entrepreneurs who have staffs, you know, with uh, sustainable businesses. I mean, I, 
even myself, I mean, I, I find a lot of stress and anxiety around, you know, among my employees. And I, I notice, you know, people taking more time off. Um, they're, they're, they're acting a little bit, you know, differently and cautiously. And, you know, the best thing that we can do is allow them time, you know, in space, take the time, you know, uh, uh, increase the communication a lot more, uh, a lot more care and feeding with staff. Um, it's just, this is a very, di very difficult period. So anything uh, before we close and, and open it up to um, audience questions that uh, any, any of you two would like to um, add? I just like to say, just by being at this conference today and being in this session, you're making that change. You're making that commitment. You're making that observation that things need to happen. So thank you for all that are here and making those changes. Ditto. I'd like to thank you all for um, you know being here as well. And I would tell you that um, we are up uh, for the challenge. All those businesses out there, I tell people, particularly for the minority-owned businesses, that if the Urban League can't bet on you, who can bet on you? I'm betting on businesses, and I'm betting on us coming back better. And so all the business owners that are listening out there, I'll tell you to hang in there because we're going to um, come through uh, like uh, America always does. So um, we've got confidence in you. We've got faith in you. So hang in there. That's awesome. There's a question in the chat room here from um, uh, Ross Larson. Yes, you know, over the last several years, U.S. companies pledged 50 billion towards racial equity, and according to a study from Creative Investment Research, but the but the firm says that since then only 250 million, you know, has been spent or devoted to a specific initiative. You know, how can we keep companies accountable for their promises, be they investment, employment, or otherwise? I would say who's defining diversity and then who's um, defining what that achievement is. Because if I told myself self do better and I just took one step forward, then I'd still say that I've reached my goal. And so there has to be community accountability and tracking of these things. And if you see that they're not doing what they pledged to, then it takes us as consumers to step back and say, that's not who I want to be affiliated with. And you saw this a lot with opera companies around the U.S., with Black Voices Matter and uh, Opera Voices Matter and things like that, that people started pulling their funding, donors started pulling their funding if they didn't see the same representation on stage as the people in the community that it was serving. And so your dollars and your commitment and your uh, showing up matters. I yeah, I, 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 oh, good, well. No, no, I, I just said I agree. Okay, I would agree also with Pranisha that um, it makes a difference if you're tracking if you're, if you're not tracking, you don't know how well you're doing. And then you also need to hold uh, folks accountable by uh, having them be transparent. They have to show, you know, um, what they're doing. And then we have to really uh, do our diligence and make sure that we're watching and, and, and making sure if they're saying that they're going to use minority-owned companies, they got funds to do that, uh, we expect uh, that they deliver on that. Some companies are just, um, they just talk and they don't deliver, but we have to hold them accountable. One of the things that I know for sure is, you know, um, African American and women leaders hire African American and women folks, <laughs> and so we we really just have to, you know, uh, push companies to hire more people of color. Some of that is as simple as that, and that changes a lot of the narrative, you know, right there. It's it's really hard, you know, to make those changes, you know, without you know, people in the inside going, hey, this is what we need to do, and it's okay, and it's it's good for us. And expansive mentorship, because there are going to be those times where you're the only person in the room, and you're not going to know how to react or to respond. But having a mentor that has been there, that has worked in predominantly white spaces and positions of leadership, can really change the way you view your ability. Once again, seeing is believing. Representation matters. When you see people doing what you want to do, you then believe you can do it. And creating a mentoring relationship where you actually know that person makes it even more achievable and believable. Yeah, in my industry, there are, I'm going to say, 18, 1,700 television stations. Um, there are only 20 African American general managers, you know, and then when I when I was, uh, you know, in my, my my younger years, I was either the only one or one of three. So we twenty decided that we would, you know, have a continual dialogue on what can we do to bring, you know, people into our organizations and into our industry so that we can help change, you know, the the, the face of broadcasting. Yeah. So so Lyle, typically. 
um, when people are being elected into our organizations or brought into our organizations, if you don't have a diversified panel and you have like an all white panel, most likely minorities may not get through the door. So you have to diversify those panels. The other thing is like, it has to come from the top. The, the president of the company, you know, has to say, you know, I want this. And then it has to be a part of um, performance metrics to say at when it's time to do the performance evaluation, how do you do, you know, on, on diversity, equity, and inclusion and show me the, show me the metrics, just like you do in any other business. And then the last thing, if you don't, you know, do that, you'll have many people being like you just described what we call the lonely only, right? You know, yeah. they hire one black person in the law firm, or they hire one black person in the newsroom, or they hire one black person in the engineering firm, and they think they've accomplished diversity, equity, and inclusion, or they hire their one black DEI officer and think they got it done. So uh, I'll take it one step further, or they hire one white woman. Because once again, who defines diversity? And so in some aspects, a white woman is considered diversity and they've reached their goal. Absolutely. Another comment is that you forgot where they put us on the brochures. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, people can see through that, but no, that's a point well taken. Um, any, other, any other questions um, for the panel, folks? We got just a couple of minutes left. Here's one. Uh, Pranisha, you have the unique experience of working with students and in the business community. Is there anything you've learned through working with students that surprised you or pre and perhaps differences in generation? Uh, for the younger folks, I've learned that there's this culture where they believe that, you know, schooling is no longer needed and anything they need to know they can learn online. Um, and it's been quite, you know, I say, I wouldn't want a doctor or a surgeon that learned everything they learned on YouTube. Um, and there's just certain things that we need to know. And the college degrees also show employers that you can commit to something you can learn something and that you are an avid learner. But what I am learning is that the value of education is becoming less and less. Um, and so I hope that I can change that. Even in music, you still need that degree. You still need those fundamentals in order to build what you want to do. Um, the other difference in generation is instantaneous. They want things to happen overnight. Our younger folks want things to happen overnight. And if it doesn't, they lose interest. So you have to be really quick moving with anything that you put out there for our youth or you will not catch them. You will not capture them. So I don't do any workshops over 30, 40 minutes. I know that the attention span is you get 15 minutes to make your introduction and you get 25 minutes to make your impact. If you can't do it in that time, then don't bother doing the workshop. You're absolutely right. So we're in 11 schools, uh, nine in Madison and two in Sun Prairie. And one of the things that my director of education told me, he said, uh, and to our surprise, the kids are sick of social media. We thought that yes. the kids would love, you know, um, social media because they're on it all the time, but they're sick of social media as a, as a venue for serving up their education. And so we did summer camps this summer and we did it on social media and our numbers were lower um, this summer than they have been in the past because kids are sick of it. They're ready for face to face, even though they may not want to be in school, they're ready for a different, you know, way of serving up education. And I would challenge that and not, not necessarily face to face, but tangibles to walk away with. So when we did the cooking class and they were actually able to do it interactively and taste the food and to like physically feel like they're in the space without being in the space, that made a difference in the workshops too. So if you're doing workshops around technology and coding, being able to talk to their teacher in real time and build the code and to see those pieces turn into actual games in real time would be a better engagement than just talking at the youth. That's what social media is. You're reading or you're watching and they're done with that. I had an interesting experience. I was working with um, a university, uh, uh, taking their interns and we use their, their interns. And uh, you know, I got a chance to talk with um, um, you know, the president and I was telling him about their curriculum versus what is really happening in reality and how we can you know, fine tune that. But, 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 but I made the point that I said, you know, it's interesting we, when we ever have to fire somebody or discipline someone, it's generally never around sort of the skill sets they have. A lot of it is around things like 
you know, communication, teamwork, the ability to get along, uh, the ability to show up, things like that. And, you know, that discussion, you know, led to them adding into their school uh, curriculum modules around, you know, uh, emotional intelligence, etiquette, manners, assessments, things like that, that help prepare, you know, folks from a, from a, from soft skills, you know, point of view. And that, well, it's that social, you know, that EQ versus IQ. Yes. And a lot of times you see folks with really high IQs, but low EQ and engagement because they spent, you know, a lot of their years engaging in books and being in this type of isolation. And for years, schools never taught emotional quotient development. So now you're hearing all of this language around social emotional learning, and it's not just around mental health, and it's not just around behaviors, because historically, children that have behaviors were the ones that got the social emotional triage and all children actually needed that triage right because you know in business and anything else relationships really trump everything at the end of the day absolutely so um any other any other thoughts any other questions Ross asked about, are we hosting mental health first aid classes? I'm actually teaching one on Saturday that's full, and I will add to the CNS Believe In website the next upcoming courses. Um, I'm funded through a grant through the state of Wisconsin, and so I get classes as they provide me money. So, yes. Thanks for catching that. All right, we're almost at the top of the hour. Benny, there you go. This has been so incredible. Oh my gosh. I know there is one question that I saw Robinson post that I wanted to see if, if you guys wanted to, to tackle that one quick. Um, and then, yeah, maybe that's our last one for the day. I think um, Robinson was asking, um, how would you suggest that anybody break into a predominantly white space such as venture capital or um, executive consulting, enterprise consulting? Be prepared for rejection. So just because you ask doesn't mean that somebody's going to say yes. And to think about that for every four no's, you're going to get your one yes. So you have to be mentally prepared that as you go into the space that everybody not, might not be there and be willing to accept diversity, but that doesn't mean you stop trying. I say, I would say be 10 times better than the, uh, the average uh, company because that's what's going to be uh, expected. You know, and as much as we think that, you know, we're going to get treated equally, um, sometimes it's not because we have... Uh, People just have biases that are intact and those biases uh, stand in the way. And I'll give you one example. You know, I had, um, uh, when I worked for the department uh, for a state agency, a guy came in looking for a job. It was an entry level kind of planning job, but he had an MBA and he had years of planning experience. One of my managers came in and said, hey, I got to want to talk to you about this guy. He came in here and he's got, um, he's got jerry curls in his hair. And so I'm a little bit, you know, uh, put off by that. And I said, but what does that have to do with his credential? I said, well, tell me what these Jerry curls were. Well, when he explained them, he said they were little plaits. I said, well, those are actually dreadlocks. So you might not see that in, in Walworth County, uh, but definitely you would see that, you know, uh, as urban fashion, you know, um, by young professionals, everybody. But because of who he was, you know, um, these individuals, uh, this individual decided to, he had the best credentials in the group but he didn't get it because he who he was. You have to be careful how you present yourself and make sure that you're 10 times better. Companies tend to, look, I've been a business leader for a long, long time. And I can, you know, the way companies think is that they tend to make the safe choices. They tend yep. to hire people that they know, you know, or who are referred to them like warm introductions or things like that. And they, they don't wanna, uh, uh, you know, make bold, bold choices. So one of the things to sort of ameliorate that is if you're interested in a particular company, um, th there's several things that you, you can do, but I would do some of these things, definitely. One is um, find somebody in that organization and see if you can get them to uh, give you some, uh, like go out to lunch or if it's virtual for like a 10 or 15 minute chat to, to, to find out a little bit more about the organization and uh, get some advice about, you know, what they do and, and, uh, and those types of things. Do the information gap. Most people on the inside of a company will give you time. They'll give you 10 minutes or 12 or 15 minutes. Um, yep. And they do that because if you're showing that sort of interest, they will help support you with that. The, the, the second thing is, is um, if there are ways to intern or volunteer or do things in that company, 
jump at those opportunities too. Um, another thing is to really understand what you're about, what are your strengths, and then see with that organization, where can you actually add value? What are the things that you think that you can bring you know, to that table? So it's a, there are a lot of techniques around relationship building, which is key. And then also, you know, why should they hire you? What can you do to, to, to bring value and lessen their sense of risk? That's a great, that's great feedback. Absolutely. Awesome. And thank you so much. Oh my gosh, this was incredible. I was sitting there at like 4.55 and I was like, I'm not going <laughs> to stop this conversation. I can't, I can't be the one that pulls the plug on this. This is, this has been really, really something special. Um, I like, especially speaking and to, to other people who have been with us the whole day during the conference today, I, there, there were some moments in there where I could really feel the energy. Um, and wow. Uh, so, so many helpful things, you know, and, and things that thing to think about here in Madison that I'm just so grateful for you guys for sharing. So thank you so much for being here. We, we really appreciate it. And for, for everybody listening, um, I, I, yes, I, I'm let's, let's give everybody a round of applause quick. I'm doing this. Lyle, Pranisha, Dr. Anthony, thank you so much. Thank you so much.